Welcome to worship where we are invited into a new vision of Jesus, of our own callings, and our world. Just a few notes as we begin this time together uh, on this Transfiguration Sunday. We are our congregational smart team, that is the team that discerns where we are at in the return process, has decided to remain for now at stage two to let vaccinations take hold in our community. We are making great progress uh, across our community. Um, but we also would like to share the good news that we have a um, soft potential reopening date in mind of March 14th. So we want to give it some time. Um, we, there's some repairs that need to be done at, at church as far as making sure the air exchange is working um, so that we can have good ventilation in our worship space. Um, but we are headed toward a March 14th uh, opening of in-person worship. And so once again, once we reach there, worship's not going to look like it typically has. Uh, we will remain distance and have place, certain places to sit in the sanctuary. Um, we will uh, still be requiring masks. Uh, there will be little to no congregational singing at first as we ease ourselves back into uh, something that looks a little more like we have been used to before. And so that's it. exciting news. Um, congratulations to those of you uh, who have received a, a dose or two of your vaccine. And uh, thank you for the good work that you are doing throughout our community in keeping on your mask, maintaining distance, and working for the health and well-being of our neighbors. Beyond our weariness, above the cold winter floor, there is a glory rising born of heaven and reaching out to each one of us. A light that shines through the clouds, an invitation seeking all of who we are, that transfigures the world. A light that transforms darkness into hope that brings life from a cross, where old life ends and new life is born. In glory, Jesus meets us here, raising us from the depths of valley to the height of the mountain, carrying the weight of our humanity to the heights of heaven's glory. Let us worship from the mountain and hear again, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you, before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into pieces. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
A reading from 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, happy Shiny Jesus Day. Shiny Jesus. (laughs) We'll be singing Shine Jesus Shine a little, I think, after we talk. Oh, wow, okay. Um, Yeah, so what is Shiny Jesus all about? Right? (laughs) Every year, year preachers get get to deal with this text and wonder, (laughs) what on earth am I going to say Mm -hmm. about this strange um, moment that Mm -hmm. the disciples have with Jesus? And I think I want to think about this uh, moment as helping them and also challenging the disciples to really see who Jesus is and the whole of Jesus' ministry. When we're in Mark, right before this, we get that scene where Jesus asks, who do you say I am? And Peter gets to be A plus student and say, you're the Messiah. And then Jesus goes on to explain what that means. And what that means is that he will suffer and he will die. And after that, he will rise. And Peter is just not going to have it. And so you get this really crazy scene between them where it's like one minute, Peter's top of the class. The next minute, he's like bottom cast out of the classroom kind of thing. And despite that, we get this scene um, located really close to that. And it's a scene where the disciples um, see Jesus alongside the greats of their faith. And they see Jesus, you know, transformed. He's glowing, as you said, shiny Jesus day. Um, And it's kind of a moment of recognizing Jesus in power and Jesus as God among us. And um, in that moment, Peter wants to stay up there, to stay in this um, this glory time. And it's kind of as if Peter's forgotten all of what Jesus just said. 
in saying, yes, I am the Messiah, but that's also going to include suffering and death. And yes, it will then end with resurrection. And so I think um, just this image of shiny Jesus points to what's coming eventually, and yet also reveals what's there all the time. Hmm. Right? Because if we think about, <clears throat> oh, when's Jesus going to be shining and, and lifted high again? Well, not in Mark's gospel, but in other gospels, you get that sense at the resurrection. Um, and yet here we see this glimpse. And I wonder if that doesn't push us to see Jesus' glory in everything else that happens. Jesus' hmm. glory in um, his healing and, and those miracles of power, but also Jesus' glory in his tears um, and sense of abandonment and crucifixion. And I think that's really important for us to remember that wholeness is all part of who Jesus is. Yeah. And the one God says, hey, this is my son. Listen, Listen to, to him. him. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me, and, and something I've been thinking about a bit lately is, you know, during this COVID time, we've been, like a lot of people, have been uh, making our way through the uh, the uh, TV series Shit's Creek. Um and that, if you don't know, that's a story of a uh, a wealthy family, the Rose family, whose empire of a like a blockbuster video style company comes tumbling to the ground due to financial mismanagement from people they trusted and things like that. Um, they end up moving to this small Canadian town that they had previously bought some years earlier, thinking how cool it was to buy a town. Um, and th they have to move there and be among kind of regular, ordinary people. And it's a really... It's a fun story of grace and understanding and compassion. But one of the things I've been thinking about in connection with this text is one of the main characters um, is an LGBTQ person. And in, in most shows featuring a person from that community, there's a lot of like conflict, there's identity issues, there's, you know, community and family maybe not being so welcoming of this person. And so the, the sh those typical stories are more about the, the crisis and the challenge of being a person with that identity in a community or family. But in Schitt's Creek, that never comes up. It's like um, this character lives in a world where he is totally accepted for who he is and, and welcomed and cared for. Um, and it made me think, and, and then afterward, after we finished the series, we watched this documentary that talked about, because we're crazy, uh, this documentary that talked about the making of the series, but especially the last season. And uh, and that character, who happens to be the writer of the show, um, talks about one of the things they wanted to do with the show is invite people into a, a world where having an identity as an LGBTQ person is just is normalized. Like there isn't the conflict and the and the and the challenge. It's it's all welcome and acceptance and inclusion and love and care and understanding. Um and how different that is from these other shows. And it and it and it made me think about the transfiguration and how this moment at the mountaintop, like the show Shits Creek, is an invitation into a different kind of a world where you are taught that there are other ways of being a human and a community beyond what you might have imagined that love and care and understanding and empathy is all normalized it's not the exception to the rule it is the rule and this this moment at the mountaintop um when peter and james and john are up there and they see shiny jesus there's something that jars them from their ordinary world and they are invited into a different kind of a vision. Jesus is up there with Moses and Elijah. And if you're the community looking back on this story, then you're like all of a sudden put in this position of, wow, this person was crucified as a criminal blasphemer, mm -hmm. an enemy of the state and of God, is up there with those guys? Like we should think about him differently mm -hmm. if we're hearing that story. And it challenges Peter and the others, you know, as it says later on, you know, he's, he starts heading toward Jerusalem here. He, he tells him to not tell anyone about this until after the Son of Man uh, is risen from the dead. And so, once again, just like the story beforehand, it's kind of bookended by the fact that Jesus is on his way toward death and resurrection. But it takes a different imagination to enter into that, to be open to the truths that might reveal himself both at the mountaintop 
and on the cross. I think I, I appreciated the, the Schitt's Creek documentary. And I yeah. think it was a, kind of a challenge to me as a preacher because they very clearly, I think, articulated um, our goal was to kind of set a vision of a new community. And that's our job as preachers. And that's yeah. the job of the scripture to help us envision the community we're called to be and to live into that. And I guess I see that more in the book of Revelation, you know, that people are seeing an image of peace at the end of the struggle that they're in. And maybe yeah. that helps them make sense of the struggle that they're in too. And so you think about like the, the struggle of our present time of, and how we can then proclaim Jesus present. You know, it's not just that Jesus arrived on the mountain, became shiny Jesus, was revealed for all his glory. Peter said, we'll build you a temple. And Jesus said, okay, yeah, this is where I belong. I'm here, right? I mean, Jesus then goes down to yeah. continue his ministry. And we're supposed to remember that that same presence of God, that our, our very God in the flesh is with people who are hurting and struggling, is, is touching people who are sick that other people have been avoiding, um, is breaking bread with people who will betray him. And that's the kind of new world vision that we see. Not a God that demands perfection or a God that demands sacrifice or a God that participates in violence, but a God who comes um, veiled, hidden in human form, hidden among us, and, and continues to be present um, among us in those places, other people are kind of like, eh, we're not close enough friends. I'm not really going to stick around while yeah. you're deal dealing with this. And that comes up a bit in our New Testament reading, the sense of veiledness and blindness. Um, and in that passage from Corinthians, it's talking about, you know, that uh, the God of this world has blinded people from the truth of the gospel. Um, but we do that ourselves <laughs> just as well, that we, if, if there maybe are so many transfiguration moments in our lives where Jesus meets us on the mountaintop or in our suffering, um, wherever it might be. Um, sometimes we miss those moments because we're not really um, resonating with the vibe that those moments mm. bring to us. And so there is a, a truth of things being hidden from us. And, and so the struggle then is to shift to shift our expectations. And that's what I think this story does. It, it shifts it for Peter, James, and John. It shows them, yeah, the one you are seeing glorified is one who will enter into the suffering of the world. Um, and it kind of shifts their perspective in that way so that they see every other moment that Jesus does. Like you said, the healings and the, the feedings and all these, they can now see in a new way that this is really what it means to be glorified, not to rule on some throne or have the temple built for him, but but to enter into the struggles of the creation. Because that's Peter's problem, right? That was Peter's problem when he couldn't follow Jesus from I'm the Messiah and that means suffering as well as glory. Yeah. And I think we need to shift our expectations of what, I don't know, what benefits we get from God maybe or how God is present. If, if we're saying to ourselves, God is present when things are going well, and God's the one who makes everything better, um, then I think we miss out on how God is present in the midst of struggle, how God suffers with us, yeah. and how God isn't afraid to to really be that one who fully knows our suffering. And as, as Christ followers, I think it reminds us what our role is. You know, if Peter's imagining building some nice little temples and hanging out there, well, maybe Peter's imagining something pretty cushy for himself too right yeah, i mean true, yeah. he gets to be oh you know i'm the ticket taker up to see the the fancy god or something like that and that makes me by association that gives me honor and glory because i'm next to the guy who's super glorified um but if jesus is not only that one with glory but also the one who is rejected and abandoned that shifts who we are supposed to be exactly, as christ yeah. followers and if we're supposed to be the presence of Christ, um, both with those who are at the height of their lives and those who are at its depth and people who have felt completely pushed out of life and society. Like we're called to be among them because that's who we see Jesus is among. And, um, and we can remember that Jesus is with us in those moments too. And 
And in the end, we get this vision that the glory and healing of God and the life-giving power of God is what's going to fully encapsulate everything. That that is the, the future resurrection, the new creation that we look forward to. But in the meantime, Jesus is with us in whatever, all the junk. I think this speaks to us as individuals, as individual disciples, and also as the church. You know, I think um, part of Peter's problem was his own vision of success as the Messiah. Oh boy, yeah. And for us as churches, I think we tend to have our own vision of success or our own nostalgia about what was. And we we kind of look as far back as the 70s, but we don't think about the church um, way before that and the ways that church was church and disciples were disciples. Mm. And I think... A passage like this calls us to remember that the role of the church isn't to serve itself, isn't to grow itself, isn't for more butts in the pews and bucks in the plate, but it's about following Jesus and listening to Jesus, really hearing hmm. what was Jesus doing, what was Jesus teaching, what was Jesus calling people to do. And that's what we're called to do individually and corporately as congregations. And that might mean our churches don't measure up to some kind of societal expectations. Um, people might think we're fools if we trade in that image of shining glory on the mountain for a, a more, I don't know, grassroots and less flashy kind of mm. existence. And yet Jesus is, is there. Our, our role is to proclaim Jesus present wherever we are and to hear that for ourselves, that Jesus is with us too. time you are invited into the practice of generosity, uh, you may send in an offering to our church mailbox or bring it by the church mailbox to drop off. In so many ways, God is creating a spirit of generosity and compassion in our community. took the three disciples to the mountainside to pray. His countenance was modified, his clothing was a flame. Two men appeared, Moses and Elijah came, they were at his side. The prophecy 
The legislation spoke of whenever he would die. Then there came a word of what he should accomplish on the day. Then Peter spoke to make of them a tabernacle place. A cloud appeared in glory as in accolade they fell on the ground. A voice arrived, the voice of God, the face of God covered in a cloud. He said to them, the voice of God, the most beloved Son. Consider what He says to you, consider what's to come. The prophecy was put to death, was put to death, and so will the Son. Your word disguise the vision till the time has come. Lost in the cloud. O voice, have no fear, we draw near, lost in the cloud, a sign, son of man, turn your ear, lost in the cloud, a voice, lamb of God, we draw near, lost in the cloud. A sign, Son of Man, Son of God, lost in the cloud. A voice, have no fear, we draw near, lost in the cloud. A sign, Son of Man, turn your ear, lost in the cloud. A voice, Lamb of God, we draw near, lost in the cloud. A sign, Son of Man, Son of God, lost in the cloud. A voice, have no fear, we draw near, lost in the cloud. A sign. Son of man, turn your ear, lost in the cloud. On this last Sunday after Epiphany, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need, responding to each petition with the phrase, Alleluia, Amen. O God of light, we pray for communities of faith around the globe. For our own congregation, for our pastor, for all Christians who cannot gather for communal worship, show us your face in the darkness and speak your word of power to all the faithful. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. O morning star, we pray for the earth, for life forming in the dark earth and ocean depths, for creatures seen and unseen, and especially for the animals who require cold and ice. Give us your Spirit's guidance in our stewardship of the planet. Hear our prayer, O God. 
Alleluia. Amen. O Son of Righteousness, we pray for our nation's elected leaders, for attorneys and juries, and for all who work for justice in our land. Give to them all integrity and service and courage to choose what is right. We pray for our citizenry that prejudice cease, that resentment about the election wane, and that violence be averted. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. Beautiful Savior, we pray for all who suffer from COVID-19, for medical workers, and for all who await the vaccine. We pray for those enduring famine, for those experiencing homelessness, for the people of Yemen, and for all who live in war zones. We pray for all who are ill, for all who receive no medical care, and for those we name here before you now. Heal them with your loving might. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. Love divine, we pray for those who, especially on this Valentine's Day, feel lonely, for those who are abandoned, and for those who must live apart from their dear ones, especially for the children separated from their parents at our nation's border. Embrace all who are alone with your care. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. We remember before you all who have died in the faith, especially the missionaries Cyril and Methodius and the reformer Martin Luther. And for those who come into our mind now, be with us in our every darkness until at our end, we join with the saints in your everlasting light. Hear our prayer, O God. Alleluia. Amen. O Holy Trinity, light creator, light of light begotten, and light revealer. Receive our praise and hear our prayers for the sake of the one who dwells among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Not all is as it seems. There is a glory hidden in everything waiting to be revealed to the eyes of those who believe beyond what seems inevitable, who do not want to live in the status quo, but in the promises of God. Hold on to the vision as we turn toward Lent and walk the more difficult path. There is yet a greater glory still to be revealed. Go in peace, live in hope, and serve all in love. Amen.